Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Last church age, church of Laodicea, there is no commendation. The Lord has nothing good to say about this church, not one word. Let's pray, Heavenly Father, thank you for another opportunity to share your word. Help me to share it, to be clear and precise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just a few things about this church. 50 miles located southeast of Philadelphia. Either way, you, you look at the horseshoe, whether you turn it upside down or not. If you, it probably works well if you turn the horseshoe upside down. Uh, Laodicea is on the bottom. It's right on the bottom of the horseshoe. It's actually, they're all located in the, in the shape of a horseshoe. All these, and by the way, none of these churches are in existence today. The area is, is run by uh, Turkey, and uh, the largest percentage is Muslim. There are no, none of these churches are existent. Although they are still existent in the things that God had to say about them, they're still existent. Those things he had to say is still existent. They were known they had their own banking. Pay attention to this. They manufactured expensive cloth made from soft black wool. They had a medical school. It was famous for the development of ear salve, of ear salve rather, made of spice and flurgeon powder. They were also known for, their, for other salves, for eye salve and ear salve. It's interesting the Lord addresses that. Laodicea was so wealthy when a massive earthquake destroyed the city in 60 AD, it refused aid from Rome and rebuilt at its own expense. Uh, Paul was aware of their spiritual struggles, struggles in Colossians 2.1. Okay. Revelation chapter 3. Are you there? Verse 14. Let me try to get there. Amen. Does anybody know what amen means? So be it. Well, also the Hebrew word that's used for it also means true. The word amen means true. So when you say amen to something, you're affirming. You're making your affirmation that you agree with that. When, you, when the preachers say amen, that means yes, yes, I agree with you, Pastor. I, I also agree with that statement. So you're making your affirmation. You're consenting to that. Uh, and I like the word finality. It has the meaning of finality. The amen. Well, when I asked that question in a, in a church, uh, Christian church school, a little girl said, I know what amen means. It's time to leave. <laughs> well, that's the finality, you see. She said it was time to leave. And, of course, that was always music to my ears when I was that age. I liked to hear the word amen. <laughs> it was time to go. and have to... Be so quiet, man. Mom and dad said, shh, 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 shh. Be quiet. Faithful, we sang about that. Faithful. The faithful and true witness. Jesus is true and he's faithful. You can count on him. He is God. God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. In John 3, 34. We're going we're to try to move right on here. We got... Uh, a uh, little bit of time here, so we got to take advantage of it. These things, verse 14, saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I want to just talk about this. This is not the beginning of Jesus. This is not talking about the actual creation of Jesus, as some cults would teach. This is not the beginning or creation of Christ. Christ always was. He was from always the beginning. Where did God come from? Someday maybe we'll find out. I don't know, and I can't tell you where he came from. I don't know. He always was, and so was Christ. Christ was from the very beginning. This is not, the, this is not talking about the creation of Christ himself. Listen to John chapter 1 and verse 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then Colossians 1, 16 and 17, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, 
whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. Well, without him, it's, as we've come up with, and we come up with this study, without him you can do nothing. Without him you can do nothing. Many churches today are trying to operate without him. It's no wonder the results they're getting is nothing. It's no wonder our nation is in the shape of it, that it's in because of our churches I'm going to put the blame on. When I go to church, I want to hear the gospel preached. I don't want to hear anything else. But is the gospel being preached in many of our churches? You'd be amazed at what's being preached. God had nothing good to say about Laodicea. Now look at verse 15 with me. If you're following the chart over here, it's the second one, condemnation, verses 15, 16, and 17. This is what the Lord condemns the church for. They are sickeningly lukewarm. How many of you like lukewarm water when you drink water? Oh, brother, when I was in Russia, they didn't have ice cubes. Yuck. Lukewarm water. No ice cubes. Do you know where ice cubes came from? That's an American thing, by the way. That's America is known for ice cubes. Ice in my water. I like ice in my water. I like my water cold. And I like my coffee hot. Hello. <laughs> and that's what the Lord's saying here. I would rather you be cold or hot. Lukewarm. Yeah. Lukewarm. I know your works. Thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. Our Lord here makes it clear he's fully aware of the neutral condition of the church in these last days. It's a compromised church. It's a people's church. It's what kind of church you do whatever you can do to get people in here. No, I don't agree with that. Preach the gospel. Preach God's word. That's what needs to be done and preached in the churches. Not anything else. Amen. If I'm going to get ready to go to church, I don't want to come to church to hear a bunch of stories or your opinion. I want to hear God's word. Plain and simple. Why can't we get that? Well, because the devil don't want God's word to be preached because people's lives would be changed. And he don't want any lives to be changed. He wants his churches to be lukewarm. That's why so many of them are lukewarm. What a description of our modern day church. All kinds of organizations and programs and committees and activities, but no power. The Holy Ghost warns through Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 5, in the last days many would be characterized as having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. This lukewarm church claims to represent Jesus Christ, but never sees the transformation of a soul from darkness to life. That's how you can tell when the Holy Ghost is in residence there, when people's lives are being changed. We don't see any changes anymore. People are not, not sorry for their sins. They're cozy in their sin. Don't you preach to me. I don't want to go to a church that preaches the truth. No, because then you'd have to change. And you like the way you're living, so why bother? Seek out a church that don't preach the gospel. There you'll be comfortable and cozy. Yes, a church with no power. An apostasy church. A church of Laodicea. These churches are more interested in social action than gospel action. More interested in reformation than transformation. More interested in planning than in praying. So then because thou art lukewarm, verse 16, and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. They made the claim, but the Lord knew exactly. They are deceived about themselves. 
Verse 17, because thou sayest, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You see, all deception is evil. But the most devastating deception is self-deception. How do you get somebody to know they need help if they don't think they need help? You ever try to get a drunk help? I don't need no help. Self-deception is the worst. When you think you don't need any help, look in the mirror. Do an evaluation. Are you where you need to be today? Are you serving the Lord? Or are you serving your self-interest? Are you already a part of the apostate church? You probably are. And you don't know it. Hmm. The worst deception is self-deception. The Laodicean church has deceived themselves. Listen to Laodicea's description of herself. Verse 17, I am rich and increased with goods. I have need of nothing. Material abundance, I can tell you, is not conducive to spiritual vitality. The Laodicean church of today is rich. Her churches are the finest. She has fabulous architecture, million-dollar buildings, fundraising organizations, strong membership, and say, I have need of nothing, but doesn't realize her poverty-stricken state. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Man can organize, man can build, man can promote, promote, man can preach, man can teach, but only the Holy Ghost of God can convict the souls of men. Only the Holy Ghost of God can transform the lives of men. Only the Holy Ghost of God can glorify Jesus Christ, who said the Holy Spirit, he shall glorify me, John 16 and 14. That's how you can tell whether a church is on fire and the Holy Spirit is there. If the church glorifies man, it is not not the work of the Holy Spirit, for the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus Christ and him only. This church age does not. We have churches today that promote prosperity gospel. If you serve the Lord, you'll be rich. Well, then why isn't everybody rich? A church of apostasy. We'd rather come to church and talk about nice things that soothe me. Talk nice to me. Come on, talk nice to me. Say nice things about me. You can find those churches anywhere. Just go check them out. They talk nice. They don't want to offend anybody. They just tiptoe through the tulips. Don't want to offend anybody. Those in hell will say, why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you tell me? I did. You wouldn't listen. You didn't want to hear it. Mm. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in thy name have cast out demons and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Here's the Lord's description of Laodicea. Wretched and miserable. Even though she gave herself lessons on positive thinking and lots of books on how to have peace, inwardly, they were unhappy, wretched, for riches never satisfy the hungry heart of a man. For what doth it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Poor. Even though rich in material things, they were poor because they did not know Christ. It's certainly in accord with our Lord's statement in Mark 8, 36, for what should it profit a man if he were to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Jesus said they were blind. 
They thought they knew and understood through their sophisticated education, but they didn't understand the ways of God. It's certainly illustrated in Christendom's invasion of civil rights today. The pulpits of churches are being used today as sounding boards for racial agitation. Are you listening to me? It shows the blindness of these churches. You see, they're striving to solve man's racial problems externally or by means of education. And I can tell you that is impossible. For man's nature must be changed internally. You get saved, you'll have a change of heart, and you'll love one another as Christ loved you. Amen. It's not about black lives. All lives matter. Babies' lives matter. All lives matter. It starts inside. When there's a change of heart, you won't recognize the color on the outside. And that's where it has to start. You might not came to hear it, but I came to preach it. <laughs> Jesus Christ can do that. The more man tries to solve social problems without Christ, the more confused the problems will become. The Lord said, you're naked. The Laodicean church was clothed with religion. She wrapped her religious robes about her and burned her candles and waved her symbols and offered her chants and read her creeds. But Jesus Christ sees her as naked, for she is not clothed by faith with the garments of righteousness. And oh, that this church could realize that the name of Jesus Christ, which she uses but does not believe in, as the divine Son of God. Why can't we recognize him as the son of God? Oh, he was just a good man. He was just a good man. Went around doing good things. But he was not the son of God. Yes, he was the son of God. You bet he was. And you better believe that. He was the son of God. And to the Jews, they crucified him. So here's our Lord's counsel. Verse 18, trying to move along here. Here's our Lord's counsel to the church of Laodicea. There's four things, all of which are part of the salvation experience. And so that tells me that this church needed to know how to be born again. Isn't that sad? That a church needs to know how to be born again. First of all, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich. Eternal riches are not appropriated by material possessions. They've been appropriated by the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and they are available by faith. 1 Peter 1, 7, the trial of your faith is more precious than gold. The Laodicean church was labeled poor, but they were asked to buy something. They were that poor, they couldn't buy it. In the book of the prophet Isaiah 55 and 1, we read God's invitation to man to come and buy what they need without money and without price. Salvation is not purchased through man's efforts. It has been purchased for man by the death of our Savior on Calvary's cross. Therefore, the poorest of the poor can pay the price. which is to humble ourselves and call upon the name of the Lord. Secondly, I counsel thee to buy me white raiment. This talks about the righteousness that's required to come into God's presence. He knew their nakedness. He knew their need for white raiment. White raiment represents righteousness. Isaiah 61.10, we read of God's provision for the garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness. And as a bride or groom that is preparing for marriage, righteousness is imputed to men when they call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Thirdly, anoint 
your eyes with salve, that thou mayest see. How many people today are blind? There are more than you know. There are more people blind than you will have any idea. Man needs a spiritual awakening. We need a spiritual illumination. No matter how brilliant man thinks he is, unless he's indwelt by the spirit of Jesus Christ, he will never understand the ways of God. Only the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus said would be our teacher, can cause us to understand the ways of God. Now listen to this, these words. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Is it any wonder that nobody knows what to do? I don't know how to vote. Well, that just goes through me like lightning. What do you mean you don't know how to vote? What's the matter with you? I know what's the matter. You're blind. I know exactly what's the matter. I understand fully now. And the same people will vote the Antichrist in. Mark my word. They will. You betcha. They'll put him in. And it'll be too late. They'll have marked their fate. The only thing in the tribulation period is the guillotine. The beheading of Christians. That's the only way you'll be saved. For you see, the Holy Spirit has already raptured the church out. Your only means of salvation is the guillotine in the tribulation period. Pay attention because it's nearer than you think. It's closer than you think. Fourthly, be zealous therefore and repent. Do your first love. God exhorts us that we need to repent. And then the message is to individuals. I'm closing with this. The last message is to us individuals. Behold, verse 20, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The artist, Holman Hunt, was a man who painted Christ knocking at the door. That was the artist. The artist had, had invited his friends to look at his painting to critique it, you know, to pick at it, to see if they could find anything wrong with it. One of his friends said, Holman, there's no knob on the outside. You forgot the door handle. No, Holman said, I did not. The door represents man's heart. And God does not force himself into any man's heart. You see, Holman said the handle is on the inside. The handle's on the inside. The late Dr. Lee Scarborough, the great preacher from Texas, told of the conversation of a well-to-do businessman who came forward at the close of a service. The pastor asked who it was that God used to speak to him about Christ. He had heard the preaching of D.L. Moody, Truett, and many other outstanding ministers, but said none of those great preachers moved me. About eight years ago, God saved my wife. I have watched her now for these eight years as she's been faithful to Jesus in poverty and in riches. Night after night, I've watched her kneel beside our bed to pray. I've watched her as she went faithfully to prayer meeting and church service, putting Jesus Christ first in every area of her life. Last night, as we retired, when we kneeled to pray, I began to think of the difference bet between her life and mine. And as I laid there, I thought of my life as a little molehill of nothing and her life as a great mountain for God and righteousness. I got up out of bed and for the first time in eight years, I asked my wife 
to pray for me. And last night, by my bedside, I was led to Jesus Christ, not by D.L. Moody or George Truett, but by my lovely wife. Yes, there's no question about it. Jesus knocks on the door of men's hearts through his people. Are you one in whom he would like to work through? You can be. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I've finished my message today. Brother Roger, this message touched my heart. I don't know if I were to die, if I'd go to heaven. Would you pray with me? Would you slip your hand up? If you don't know for sure, is there anyone? I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to pray where you're seated. Is there anyone? You're not sure. You can be sure today. There's no, no reason for you to leave and not be sure. All right. I'm going to assume that you're all ready. Now I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for this opportunity I had today to share your precious word. And Lord, I pray for this church. I pray for other churches throughout this land. I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to the pastors of these churches and realize that they need to be preaching your word. Nothing else. Nothing about politics. Nothing about anything else that matters. This doesn't all matter. What matters is your word. Your gospel is what matters. That your word goes forth and people's lives can be changed. So, Lord, I pray, speak to these pastors all across this land. When they get time for their time of devotion, I pray, Lord, that you'll show your, your passage in your word and show them they need to be preaching your word. They need to be teaching your word. It's your word that will change lives, not anything else. It's your power that will change lives. Father, thank you for, again, the opportunity today. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. We're going to go out here outside the door, and we're going to have the placement of the, of the bricks today.